Distinguished different levels of explanation. Um, so at the bottom you can see the behavioral level and this is the level at which we describe the symptoms of dyslexia and at which dyslexia is defined in international classifications. And the main uh, aspect of the, the definition is that um, uh, the child has a reading level that is far below the reading level that is expected given this child's age, given his grade and the teaching that he or she has received, and given his intelligence level and his perception that is found to be normal. And so all these uh, lead to expectations about a certain reading level at a certain stage, and this child is far below that expectation. So that's the definition. These are the main symptoms. And then, of course, the, the goal is to try and understand the cause of the symptoms. And so you can describe causes and their relationships at many different levels. Uh, the level that is closest to the behavioral level is the cognitive level. So here we're talking about all information processes in the brain that generate behavior and thought uh, and language. And so in order to understand why a child fails to acquire to read properly, we may hypothesize that the child may have some deficits at the cognitive level. This is a hypothesis, and of course, we uh, carry out experiments to test those hypotheses. If we find evidence for a cognitive deficit in dyslexia, then of course we try and understand the cause of this deficit. And inevitably, the cause is to be found in the brain. So this is why we go on to another level of description, which is more a biological level, and where we look uh, in the brain to see if there are some crucial differences between children who grow up to become dyslexic and the others. And in fact, you can describe uh, the brain, so sorry, if I may go back one step. Uh, at the cognitive level, uh, it is already well established that the main cognitive deficit that dyslexic children have is a so-called phonological deficit. That is a deficit with uh, the processing of speech sounds, uh, which is a direct cause of the difficulties when learning to read. This is not controversial, at least for a majority of dyslexic children. There must be a minority of dyslexic children who may have some other deficits, different from phonological. But this is the, the picture that seems to be true on average. Um, now, if you go to the brain level, then you may want to, de to differentiate two different levels. Uh, the, the differences that you may observe at the functional level, so in terms of brain function, brain activations, as you can see them using fMRI. And you may also want to look, oops, sorry, at structural uh, differences in terms of uh, brain anatomy. And if you go back even further, one step, uh, and you try and ask what are the causes of these differences in the brain, uh, then you, uh, you may want to go and look in the genome because there are genetic factors involved and also in the environment because we know that many environmental factors are important for reading development. So today we'll be concerned only uh, with uh, the, the brain level. I will first uh, say a few brief things about what we know about the, the functional level, but I think that other speakers after me, in particular Ken Pugh, are going to, to speak in greater details about functional brain differences. Um, so to, to give just a, a review in one picture, this is a result of a meta-analysis of functional brain differences uh, between dyslexic and control individuals. And so you can see that the regions in red are the regions uh, for which dyslexic children have less activation than controlled children, uh, whereas those in yellow are regions where they have more activation than uh, controlled children. Um, and so these regions are part of a, uh, a brain network uh, that participates in reading and that is going to be described in further detail by Stanislas Dehan uh, later. Um, you can also see that those differences 
uh, in functional terms differ between children and adults. So if you compare adult dyslexics and adult controls, uh, the dyslexics show less activations in the blue regions and more activation in the green regions. So it's a slightly different pattern because of course children grow up, their um, linguistic and reading abilities uh, change and therefore uh, the differences uh, uh, evolve with uh, development. Um, now of course the fact that there are differences in brain activation between dyslexic and control individuals is entirely expected. Even before we had this data, we knew that we were going to find such differences because reading is carried out by the brain. And so if those people read differently, if they read less well, if they have difficulties when reading, then of course this must have a counterpart in the activations of their brain regions for reading. Uh, so this is extremely interesting to observe this and to try and interpret the different regions that are either more or less activated, but this is in no way a surprise. This is absolutely expected. And it's not clear whether this tells us the cause of dyslexia or the consequence of dyslexia, because of course these brain activations, they may be there in the first, these, these differences may be there in the first place and may be the reason why they fail to acquire to read, but they may not be there in the first place and they may emerge as a consequence of not learning well to read and not training their reading networks in the same way as the controlled children. So it's difficult to talk about uh, a cause here. You, it's better to think of these activations as a functional, uh, neural functional correlate of the, the deficits that are observed at the, the cognitive level. So this is why uh, if we want to think in terms of causes, it is interesting to think in terms of neural anatomy as well. So uh, I've decided in the interest of time not to speak uh, to, to show our results on functional uh, brain imaging in dyslexia today, uh, but if you are interested, you will see that most of my work is focused on a slightly different method and hypothesis. Uh, we're studying cortical oscillations. Uh, in the brain of dyslexic individuals. Uh, we started this in a paper that was published in 2011, and this was followed up very closely by uh, a few teams. And so now there's, a, there's a, a couple of papers in the literature that investigate cortical oscillations uh, in dyslexic individuals, and we think that this is an original way to try and understand uh, the speech processing uh, system in dyslexic individuals and try to understand the basis of this phonological deficit. So if you're interested in this, uh, please have a look at those papers. But for today, uh, we are going to uh, look specifically at neuroanatomy, uh, and I will show mostly data from this Genedis project, uh, whose main focus was indeed to, uh, to look at the, the brain structure of dyslexic children in great details, uh, and we, we tried to improve on previous published studies uh, by increasing the number of participants, uh, by trying to obtain MRI images that would have better quality, and to carry out more fine-grained analysis, in particular, avoid averaging all the brains uh, together, but looking at uh, fine anatomical details in, in each individual brain. Of course, together with the MRI, we carried out a, a large test battery to make sure we, we observe also the cognitive deficits in those children. And we also obtained a blood or a saliva sample in order to, uh, to extract DNA and to carry out a genetic analysis and to try and relate the genetic variations and the variations in uh, brain anatomy and brain function. I will not uh, talk about the genetic results today. Um, and so, um, to show uh, in more detail the, the population that we studied, the, these were 32 dyslexic children and 32 control children uh, that were well balanced in age, in sex, uh, and we put them for one hour in the MRI at Neurospin, uh, and uh, we, we dedicated most of the scanning time, about 50 minutes, to structural imaging. Uh, taking a ve very high, very good resolution uh, T1 sequence, uh, very good resolution and good parameters diffusion sequence, and also some additional 
uh, sequences that I will not uh, talk about. And we also had 10 minutes dedicated to functional imaging, which was borrowed from uh, Ghislaine and Stanislas Dehan to uh, map the, the ventral visual pathway. I will show those results. And so if you survey the literature on the neural anatomy of dyslexia, this is probably the kind of uh, summary that you would uh, extract, that people with dyslexia have less gray matter in those left perisylvian language regions, which you, which you saw on the, on the slide where you had the functional imaging uh, results. Uh, also that they may have less well-connected white matter in the left uh, hemisphere underlying those regions, and perhaps more specifically the arcuate fasciculus, which is one of the white matter bundles that connects these language areas. And perhaps some more tentative uh, results, such as uh, a different asymmetry pattern of one specific area, the planum temporale, I'm going to come back to this, and also possibly differences in the corpus callosum, and also possibly the fact that dyslexic people may have slightly smaller brains. So all these results kind of emerge from the literature, although not all of them uh, are associated necessarily with a great degree of, of certainty. So of course we want to see if we confirm those results and if we can extend them. And so the first technique that we applied is called uh, voxel-wise, uh, voxel-based morphometry. It's a technique in which you can quantify the volumes of gray matter and of white matter in the brain, uh, but in a relatively coarse manner by uh, putting all the brains of all the individuals into a common template and averaging them and comparing them statistically. Uh, this is an interesting technique because it's very easy, automatic, and uh, it's uh, very objective. You do not have to make subjective decisions, uh, but at the same time is quite coarse because it ignores uh, a lot of anatomical details. But there have been quite a few studies published in the literature in VBM, um, and these are uh, summaries of those, uh, of those studies. So in this review by Richardson and Price, for example, they show on one brain all the clusters where previous studies have found differences. Uh, so, for example, previous studies have found that control people have more gray matter than dyslexics in all those spots in red. Okay, and they have found that dyslexics have more gray matter than controls in all those spots in blue. Now, this is just a superimposition of all the different studies. This, is not, this does not tell us whether the findings are consistent from study to study. And so, in fact, people who have asked that more precise question by carrying out a proper meta-analysis of the studies have actually found much less consistency across studies. In fact, the only uh, uh, spot in the brain where they did find a significant difference between controls and dyslexics in terms of gray matter volume uh, was uh, this small spot in the posterior part of the superior temporal gyrus. Um, so it, it seems that when you actually uh, uh, properly meta-analyze the, the data present in the literature, there is less consistency than we thought there was. So this is in this, on this background that we carried out our own analysis and uh, to make a long story short, this is our results. So we find absolutely no difference between controls and dyslexics, nowhere in the brain, at least at conventional uh, statistical thresholds. So we were a little bit surprised uh, to uh, obtain such a finding and not to be able to replicate what others had found before. Uh, so uh, we, we looked at the studies that were previously published and that were entered in that uh, meta-analysis of Fabio Richland, and we, we noticed that the previous studies were based on relatively small uh, numbers of subjects. You can see 10 and 10, 19 and 19. In the best of cases, there was 32 and 32, but this was across three languages. Okay, so you can see that the sample size in all those studies is quite low. So uh, it's not clear that, that the results obtained in one study uh, are, are really representative. So we thought we, we have 32 children in each group, so we have in principle greater statistical power than all those previous studies to detect a difference in gray matter volume between dyslexics and controls, and yet we don't. So that's a bit disturbing. 
Um, so then we went on and we thought, let's add more data to, even, to increase even more our statistical power. So we added data that uh, was kindly borrowed by collaborators, uh, 46 children borrowed from Carla Monsalvo and Ghislaine Dehan, uh, also uh, 81 Polish children uh, from Kasia Jednorog in, uh, in um, Warsaw, and uh, an additional 71 German children from uh, Steffenheim in Germany. Okay, and so now we have uh, and now we pull all this data and we try to see whether there are reliable differences between dyslexics and controls. And so now we have uh, a sample size of 236 children, okay, which is almost as large as the cumulated sample size of the previous meta-analysis. So if there is something to be found, I think we, we should see it. Um, and this is what we find. And we find one single cluster in the brain that seems to differ in terms of grammatovolume between dyslexics and controls. And this is here, the left thalamus. Okay, one part of the left thalamus, which we found slightly surprising. Uh, it's not that the, the thalamus is a newcomer in dyslexia research. Some people have implicated the thalamus in dyslexia uh, before. Uh, on the other hand, it turns out that it's not been found uh, in previous uh, voxel-based morphometry studies. So it's a bit strange that we find it now where, when it has not been found before. Uh, but what is most surprising is that we actually fail to replicate the differences that people found everywhere else in the brain, in the cortex. Uh, and that's much more uh, troubling because we, we have much more statistical power than anybody else in the field. Uh, if there was something reliable that has been reported by previous studies, we should be able uh, to replicate it. And, and in fact, we should be able to find even more differences than people have found before. But we, we don't, we find much fewer. Uh, so we don't have the final explanation for this discrepancy, uh, but there's a possibility that uh, many of the the findings that have been published before uh, may be false positive results. That is, uh, differences that emerge statistically but that are just chance results. And there are many reasons why there might be such false positive results. The fact that they were based in, on studies with small sample sizes and problems that are more intrinsic to brain imaging analysis. The fact that you have many degrees of freedom in a statistical analysis with many statistical tests that you have to correct for uh, with special corrections, but it's difficult to correct for all those uh, tests and degrees of freedom. And also, of course, the fact that there is a publication bias for positive findings, such that if people uh, had found that there were no differences between control and dyslexic children before, just like we did, they would not have published it. They would have found it very difficult to publish it. So people, people have a, a, a bias towards publishing positive results, and when they found negative results, uh, they, they, they have an incentive to go back to the data and search and search and search until they find something positive to report. And that's probably not very good for uh, the state of this literature. So. This is, this is what we found, but we should say that, uh, so we, we're not very convinced by what we found using voxel-based morphometry. Even this difference in the thalamus, I think I would, want it, I would want to see it replicated by another group before really fully believing it. Uh, but anyway, we were not very enthused by VBM in the first place. It's not clear to me that it's a proper, uh, that it's really an optimal technique to analyze brain differences between dyslexics and controls. So now let's move on to techniques that I think are more promising. So the first one is to realize that volume is a composite measure of the, the, the thickness of the cortex and of its surface, okay? Uh, and so now we have the means to actually uh, uh, reconstruct the surfaces of the brain, the, the PO surface between, sorry, gray, uh, between gray matter and uh, white matter, and, and uh, sorry, between gray matter and uh, cerebrospinal fluid, which is here in red, and uh, the, the white matter interface, which is shown here in yellow, that separates gray from white matter. And so you can reconstruct that from high quality MRI images, and uh, then this g gives you a way to estimate the thickness of the cortex as well as its surface. And you can do that in each individual brain without having to merge all the brains together in a common template. 
Um, and when we started, there was only one published study on cortical thickness in dyslexia, which uh, obtained the, the following results, which were, uh, for some of them, well, they were just new results. Uh, for some of them, they were a bit uh, um, uh, surprising, like greater overall gray matter volume and cortical surface in dyslexics. That's rather contrary to the previously published literature uh, using VBM. So anyway, we started with this, and uh, we first carried out an analysis across the whole brain. And we found that uh, dyslexic children tend to have lower brain volume and lower uh, whole brain surface, which is more consistent uh, with uh, the previous literature. Uh, this is actually the data. Uh, you can see the, uh, the um, oops, sorry. Uh, this is difficult to handle. Um, you can see the controls on the left. Um, Boys are in red and girls are in, in blue. And you can see the dyslexics on the right. Again, boys in red and girls in blue. And even if you disregard the sex difference in brain volume, because there is a sex difference in brain volume, you can see that overall there is a larger brain volume in controls than in dyslexics. Um, now if you look at cortical thickness across the entire brain, this is the result of our first analysis. When we applied correct, uh, I mean, full statistical correction for multiple testing, there was nothing, no difference to be found across the brain. Then we relaxed the statistical thresholds in order to see if there was something behind, and that's what we found. With some regions in red where controls have a greater thickness than dyslexics, and some regions in blue where dyslexics had greater thickness than controls. Um, so potentially we could make up a story to uh, try and interpret those differences, uh, but before doing that, because we were beyond uh, standard corrections for our multiple tests, we wanted to see if we could replicate this result. And so we used for this purpose uh, the brains of Carla Monsalvo and Gislaine de Han. And uh, this is what we saw in their data. And so as you can see, there's absolutely no overlap between the finding in their data and the ones in ours. So for us, this was a clear indication that basically we're just looking at statistical noise, but there is no reliable difference to be observed across the brain with this number of children uh, that we have in this study. I'm not saying that there is no difference in cortical thickness whatsoever, but at least with, with this sort of data, we're unable to, to see them. Um, so then uh, Gislaine de Han had the idea of using functional uh, the functional sequence to, uh, to refine our analysis of cortical thickness. So the functional sequence was borrowed from their uh, study published in 2012, where we exposed the children very briefly to different visual images. Uh, so, of course, written words, uh, but also faces, houses, and checkerboards. And here you can see the activations of the visual system to these different stimuli. Uh, so the, the, in red is the visual word for Maria that uh, Stanislas Dehan is going to explain in detail. In uh, blue is the face fusiform area that responds to faces. And in green, uh, the, the area that responds most to, um, to houses. And so, uh, and these are the activations in dyslexics. And as you can see, they activate much less uh, the region for visual words. And so what we did is we, we did this analysis subject by subject, and we tried and identified the peak of activation of each subject for words uh, compared to all other visual objects. And so, so, we, so the peaks are, can be seen here. This is the ventral part of the brain. So here we're looking at the brain from below. Okay, so these are the peaks of activation for words for each individual subject in our study. And around the peak, we drew a sphere. So this would be the red sphere that you can see here. And in that sphere, we calculated cortical thickness. So now the question that we are asking is much more precise than before. It is, do dyslexic and control children differ in their cortical thickness in the very region that responds to visual words, which seems much more relevant than try to ask this question across the entire brain. And so when we ask this question, the answer seems to be yes. Uh, yes, but uh, with a, a caveat, that we have an interaction between group and gender such that we find the difference uh, only between uh, uh, control and dyslexic boys. This is what you see here on the left-hand side, the control boys in green, sorry, 
control and dyslexic girls. So the control girls in green and the control uh, boys, and sorry, and the dyslexic girls in yellow. Uh, and you see that in, um, sorry, I'm not showing the right things. It's difficult to point at something different from what you're looking. <laughs> that requires a lot of hand-eye coordination. So, um, no, you're comparing the dyslexic girls here in green and the control girls there in green, and there's a large difference in cortical thickness. Whereas if you look at the control boys and the dyslexic boys, there's no difference. So this is our, in our Genetis data, but so then we wanted, if we, could, we wanted to see if we could replicate this result, so we ran the same comparison on the Monsalvo and the Han uh, study, and we found exactly the same thing. The dyslexic and the control girls here in uh, orange uh, differ, but the dyslexic and control boys do not differ. And then we wanted to know, is this a cause or a consequence of, uh, of poor reading? And uh, we used a younger, uh, a group of younger children who were matched with the dyslexic children in reading ability. And, um, and you can see that with this new control group, you get again the difference between the dyslexic and the control girls, but again, not uh, between the boys. Uh, so we think we, we have uh, rather firm evidence that indeed there is a difference in cortical thickness between dyslexics and controls. Uh, in the visual world for Maria, where they have activations for words, uh, but this holds only in girls. And this cannot be entirely explained uh, by the fact that the dyslexics uh, have, uh, have poorly acquired to read. Okay, this is just what I've summarized here. And so I move on to another study where we have tried to uh, look at something different. Uh, we went back to this old finding of uh, Galaberda and Geschwind about the plenum temporale. So now we're looking at the brain from the top with the frontal lobes removed and the parietal lobes removed. And so we're seeing the superior plane of the temporal lobe. And this region is called the plenum temporale. And Geschwind at Levitsky had shown a long time ago that it's larger in the left hemisphere than in the right hemisphere in most people, 63% of the cases in their study. Uh, and Galaberda had carried out the same sort of investigations in the brains of five dyslexic people. Um, this is dissection work, right, post-mortem. And uh, he had found that people with dyslexia tended to have a more symmetrical pattern or sometimes the reversed asymmetry. Uh, uh, but then many people using MRI images have tried to replicate Galaberda's data and mostly they have failed. I mean, this literature does not give any consistent uh, uh, confirmation of the, the hypothesis of the different asymmetry. But then if you go back to Al Galaberda, he will tell you, but this, this is normal because they have not measured the plenum temporale in the same way as I measured it and Geschwind measured it. So we're not looking at different things. So then we asked him, well, teach us how to measure the plenum temporale in the way you do it. Uh, and so uh, one of my PhD students took a, a long time being taught by Galaberda how to uh, segment the plenum temporale. And of course, using all modern uh, brain imaging analysis techniques, so doing a kind of virtual dissection on those surface reconstruction where we could very neatly delineate uh, Heschel's gyrus, the plenum temporale, and the posterior rami. And we did that in 81 subjects. And the results... Uh, actually confirm Galaberda's findings so that uh, if you look in the left, so if you look in control uh, children, you can see that their left planum is larger than their right planum in blue. Uh, but if you look at the dyslexic children, they have the opposite asymmetry on average. So their right planum tends to be larger than their uh, left planum. And this holds in boys, which were the main focus of analysis in Galaberda studies. Uh, it does not hold in girls. In girls, both groups tend to have the leftward asymmetry. Uh, if you categorize each uh, individual into leftward, rightward, or symmetrical, and you count the number of brains, you obtain this, that control boys are predominantly leftward symmetric, just as Geschwind and Levitsky described, uh, and so are the, dis the control and the dyslexic girls, but the dyslexic boys tend to be uh, mostly rightward asymmetric. Uh, so here we think that uh, we, we have not only replicated Galaberda's findings, but, but 
we think that the, this may be a reliable uh, landmark, a, re a reliable risk factor in the brain uh, for dyslexia. And contrary to the previous measures that I have shown, such as uh, gray matter volumes uh, or, um, or cortical thickness, uh, we have reasons to think that the size of the planum temporale is something that is not easily modified by experience, that it's probably, uh, and in particular its asymmetry is probably determined very early on, well before the child learns to read. So, so there, are, uh, th there is a stronger possibility that this might be a, a real precursor of developmental dyslexia in the brain. Okay, and then I'm going to show you one last thing quite rapidly, which is another type of imaging that we have used to try and differentiate dyslexics from controls, which is diffusion imaging. Diffusion imaging uh, uses a complex technique to try and reconstruct, sorry, the white matter tracts uh, in the brain. And if you believe previously published study, but they're quite sparsely scattered, uh, the difference between dyslexics and control using this kind of imaging would lie in the left arcuate fasciculus, especially here in the red area, uh, that, that connects the posterior and the anterior language regions of the brain. Um, and so we've done the same kind of analysis in the brains of our children uh, and using state-of-the-art tract reconstruction techniques uh, with our collaborator Michel Thiebaud. And uh, we've reconstructed this arcuate fasciculus, and in fact the three segments of the arcuate fasciculus, because you can actually distinguish three segments. And we found some differences in the arcuate fasciculus, but actually were, they were not exactly the differences in the same segment as was shown in previous studies. So we were a bit uncertain whether this was a real result or not. But the, the real breakthrough came from a, a different uh, image analysis technique. Because in fact, standard DTI analysis has a number of problems. It does not handle very well the region in the, in the brain where fibers cross. And in fact, the region where uh, differences were suggested between dyslexics and controls is a region where several fiber bundles cross. Um, furthermore, in many studies, the arcuate fasciculus has been confounded with another fasciculus, with the, which is the superior longitudinal one. And the other thing is that this arcuate fasciculus is often not reconstructed in the right hemisphere using standard DTI. It's not that it is not present in half of the subjects, but the technique is unable to reconstruct it in the right hemisphere, which is a bit worrying because then you, can, you cannot look at asymmetry. So it turns out that uh, because we were well advised, we had very good sequence parameters for our diffusion images, and they allowed us to uh, use a more sophisticated tract reconstruction techniques, which is called spherical deconvolution. And so this is a, an image that shows you the difference between the two reconstruction techniques. Uh, this is the result of standard DTI uh, tractography, and this is the result of sphe spherical convolution, deconvolution tractography. And you can immediately see the difference that this is much sparser. Basically, you're missing most of the white matter fibers when you're using standard DTI compared to spherical deconvolution. So I think once you've seen this picture, you don't really want to carry out standard DTI anymore. So we did this uh, new analysis technique uh, on our images, and so we've reconstructed a number of tracts, tracts in the inferior part of the brain here, uh, the three branches of the superior longitudinal fasciculus, and also the three branches of the arcuate fasciculus, neatly distinguished. And to cut a long story short, we found some differences in some tracts, uh, namely the, uh, the inferior occipital frontal fasciculus, which is the one in yellow here. What we found here is that um, controls uh, that are in solid bars, they tend to have leftward uh, asymmetry of this tract, and dyslexics tend to be more symmetrical. And we found a difference in another tract, which is uh, this one, the second branch of the superior longitudinal fasciculus, where controls are typically symmetrical, and we found that dyslexics have a right hemisphere uh, bias. So these are two differences where, of course, they, they, they remain to be replicated. We tried to see if they had some relationship with behavioral measures, and this is what we found, that the asymmetry of the inferior occipital fasciculus was correlated 
uh, with reading ability in dyslexic children. And it is negatively correlated, which means that the more right words uh, the asymmetry of this tract and the more they lose in reading ability. And we found a similar pattern for the second branch of the SLF, which was again negatively correlated with reading accuracy. But again in dyslexics, but not in controls. So potentially uh, there is uh, the, the asymmetry of these two tracts uh, not only differs between controls and dyslexic children, but may explain some variation in reading ability at least in dyslexic children. Okay, I've said that already. And I'm just showing this picture uh, to tell you that this is not the end. There are many other ways to analyze uh, images of the brain. And so similarly to our analysis of the planum temporale, where we have focused on one particular landmark of the brain, which actually hosts secondary auditory cortex, so we think that it is very relevant for phonological processing. Uh, we think that it, it will be fruitful in the future to, um, to focus on other landmarks of the brain, such as the cell psi. Here, what you can see on this picture is the 64 brains of our study with the cell psi marked in different colors. And uh, with this uh, analysis technique provided by BrainVisa, we can actually reconstruct each sulcus and estimate its length, its depth, its surface, and uh, also um, uh, describe qualitatively its configuration and compare this between dyslexic and controlled children. And we have already started this. We have already some preliminary results. But again, the results when they are limited to 64 children, we do not find them uh, convincing enough. So now we're in the process of extending uh, the same analysis to the, the same data set of uh, Polish children and German children, and then when we have something reliable on more than 200 children, I think we'll be in a position to, to publish something. Um, so that's it for, for today. Just this li last slide, we, you, you may have noticed that most of the results that I've shown do, are not the same in boys and, and in girls, and that's, I think, a striking recurring theme in our research. Um, this was found already in the dissection work of Galaberda in the 80s. Uh, this was found also in a recent VBM study by the, the group of Guinevere Eden. And this is what we found in cortical thickness. Our difference was only in girls. For the planum temporale asymmetry, the difference we found was only in boys. Uh, and in the preliminary results that we have on the cell side, they also depend on the sex of the subjects. So there is this suggestion that the brain basis of dyslexia might actually differ between uh, boys and girls, which may sound a bit crazy, but it's not entirely crazy. There are pretty good hypotheses about how this might come to be. Uh, obviously, at the genetic level and also in the environment, there are probably no differences to be found. Uh, the, the underlying factors are the same, as far as we know. But uh, however, boys and girls differ fundamentally in terms of sex hormones and already from gestation in utero, uh, male fetuses are exposed to testosterone and this makes a lot of differences in their development and also this produces differences in the way they react to various kinds of insults. And so there is this idea that is actually supported by already uh, some data that the female brain, because uh, of hormonal factors would be more resilient to uh, a variety of uh, disorders. So with the same genetic basis, with the same environmental factors, uh, the, the female brain would produce a less uh, severe cognitive disorder. And so may, or the, the, to phrase it in another way, it would take more of a, of a disruption of brain development to produce uh, a cognitive deficit that would meet a certain threshold. This is a speculation, but we think that there is a growing body of evidence in favor of this. And with this, I will conclude by thanking the many collaborators who have participated, not only in the Genedis project, but also uh, in, the, in the collaborators team to the, to the gathering of all uh, this data. And thank you for your attention. How do I turn this on? Uh, I just wanted to apologize. I meant to have been sharing this session from the beginning, but I arrived just as
Frank was talking because I was sent to the wrong airport c coming from Rio to here. Um, so I apologize for being late. That's all I'll say. This, is, this very interesting paper is now open for a few questions. Anybody want any questions? Well, can I ask one? <laughs> is that allowed? Um, I, I'm a, a bit uh, concerned about this problem of girls and boys because I noticed that you had almost equal numbers of girls and boys in your original 32 and I'm just wondering whether that might have had an effect on your results. I'm, I'm absolutely clear that there are differences between girls and boys. Sure. Well, th the main effect that, is, that it has is that we are able to address this question. If you look back at previous studies, some of them had only boys, and some of them had such a disproportionate number of boys compared to girls that they were not able to enter the sex as a factor in the statistical analysis. So in fact, there are very few studies that are able to compare the brain basis between boys and girls. I think that's the main difference that we have with the others. Okay, I'm sure you're right. Uh, having more girls increases your power to find the difference. Mm. But it still is a question of how, Im how important that is, given that there's probably between two and three times as many boys as girls who are dyslexic. Yeah, absolutely true. So obviously this is not representative of the dyslexic population that you, you found, you, f you can find if you do like an epidemiological study. But I think when we do such group studies, we know that we cannot be representative of the general population. Yeah. No, very, very interesting. Well, if there are no more questions, thank you very much. And oh. Angela has a question ah. here. Go ahead. In the Vox, lovely talk, Frank, thank you. Uh, in the Vauxhall study where you found different results, I noticed that your, the, the, the majority of the other studies looked at adults. And could it be the difference in your study is that you're looking at children? So if, for example, it was a, an effect of the dyslexia, might that be something that would change as you became adult? Or is that a stupid suggestion? Well, in fact, that, that literature is mixed. I mean, you're, you're correct that the majority of studies are on adults, but there are also a number of children. And we don't seem to replicate the results of the, the children-based studies better than those uh, okay. based on adults. Um, so I think you do expect that some of the differences will differ between children yeah. and adults, just, like, just as was found in the meta-analysis of functional data but I don't know exactly in what way. I mean, okay. at least on the basis of our data, I'm not willing to say anything. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other more, any more questions? If not, let's thank Frank again. Agradecemos aos professores John Stein e Jenny Thompson pela participação no evento e também agradecemos ao Dr. Frank Ramos pela sua apresentação.